welcome friends. So, in our previous session, we started discussions about uh, scheduling of uh, operations and uh, this discussion is basically focused around process manufacturing, where uh, we have uh, job shop type of arrangement and in those job shops, uh, we can produce variety of products and each product may have a different uh, sequence of uh, operations to be performed. And uh, since more and more orders are coming, each order may be of uh, different best size and therefore, the scheduling of operations is a very complex activity in a process uh, category. And therefore, uh, we discussed that uh, it is a very serious important exercise where we have uh, various tools and techniques uh, which uh, decide that uh, how to have the maximum productivity of your job shop and uh, there are different types of uh, sequencing rules we discussed uh, in our last session that these are first come first serve, shortest uh, processing time, then uh, your critical ratio and on the basis of uh, some performance evaluating criteria, we see which particular sequencing rule is going to give you the best result. And then we also need to see that the total changeover cost and the total production time are also kept to lowest possible level. So, all these are the objectives of the scheduling exercise. And now, in this particular session, we are going to see the scheduling activity with the help of uh, some numerical examples. So, let us see a particular problem of uh, sequencing and uh, with the help of that problem, we will see that uh, how different criteria are used. So, now we want to determine the sequence in which we will have uh, process a group of uh, orders at a work center. Now, many different things sequencing rules can be followed in setting the priorities among orders and as I told these can be FCFS first come first serve, it can be shortest processing time, it can be based on critical ratio etcetera. And there are different criteria for evaluating the effectiveness of uh, these sequencing rules. Now, let us first see what are these different sequencing rules. So, the first is uh, which is very simple to understand first come first serve FCFS that is normally it is called. So, next job to process is the one that arrived first among the waiting jobs. So, as customers are coming to a particular place, they are served on the basis of their arrival pattern. So, the jobs which are coming, they will be served according to their arrivals. Then the second case can be the shortest processing time. Now, the next job which is going to be processed is the one with the shortest processing time among the waiting jobs. There are four jobs a, B, C, D. Now, they have the different processing time requirement. It takes 2 minutes, it takes 3 minutes, it takes 1 minute, it takes 4 minutes. So, the next job to be processed will be the job C first, because it is the shortest processing time. So, that is another way of deciding the sequence of uh, operations. The third is earliest due date. 4 jobs are there, 4 orders are there A, B, C, D. The customer due date, when customer is requiring, today is 12th July. Now, customer requires job A on 20th July, some other customer requires job B on 16th July, the order C is required to be dispatched on 18th July and order D is to be dispatched on 30th July. These are their due date when the customers are expecting them. So, you will now process this job B first because the due date is coming first for this particular job. So, that is based on earliest due date. So, the job which is having the nearest delivery date that will be processed first and accordingly you will decide the sequence. Then you have uh, 
another rule like uh, least slack least slack is the next job to process is the one with the least slack that is time to due date minus total remaining processing time that we discussed these two cases SPT and EDD. So, it is possible that uh, this job which is requiring uh, which is re uh, required to be dispatched on 16th July takes only one day to process it takes only one day to process, but job which is required to be delivered on 18 July it takes four days to process. So, now it is advisable to combine the system of SPT and EDD that how we can develop a rule where we can take the advantage of shortest processing time and earliest due date time and that is being combined in the form of least slack and critical ratio. Both these systems combine actually combo of SPT and EDD both these systems in one least slack we are taking the difference between the due date that is our due date. So, this is due date minus lead time lead time or bracket may you can write processing time. So, due date minus processing time gives you the slack and the job which has the minimum slack will become your priority number 1. The second is which is again the combination of uh, shortest processing time not shortest processing time it is uh, more appropriate to say that uh, it is a combination of uh, processing time and due date that is more appropriate to say that uh, these are the combinations of uh, processing time and due date. So, that we can take the advantage of uh, SPT and EDD rules. Now, in this case uh, we take the ratio of uh, processing time and due date. So, time to due date that is due date and divided by total remaining processing time total remaining processing time. So, this is known as critical ratio and then you select that job as your priority job for which the critical ratio is the minimum and then another sequencing rule can be least changeover cost where we are changing jobs from A to B, B to C like we have uh, 5 jobs as I just discussed A, B, C, D, E. Now, when you are changing from A to B the cost is uh, 10 rupees when you are changing from A to C cost may be 8 rupees when you are changing from A to D cost may be 15 rupees when you are changing from A to E cost may be 5 rupees. So, once you are change jobs from one job to another job if you are in a glass factory if you are in a glass factory and you are making black glasses your glasses are black paint and after black paint you want to make glasses which are completely white it is going to incur huge changeover cost after such a dark color you want to produce a very light color it is going to incur a huge cost. So, we have a proper sequencing system that how to reduce the intensity of color so that uh, you do not incur huge changeover cost. You can have very low changeover cost from white to black, but from black to white it is going to have a huge changeover cost. So, you should know that by following a particular sequence your changeover cost should not shoot up too much. So, that is also a very important issue in this uh, uh, sequencing uh, decisions. Then once we have uh, these different types of uh, uh, sequencing rules uh, uh, 6 rules we discussed. Now, the second important thing in this case is uh, the 
effectiveness of these rules. So, how to evaluate the effectiveness of these rules, the criteria on the basis of which we are going to compare these different rules. Now, there are four important parameters, four important uh, you can say dashboard items uh, which we are going to evaluate. And these dashboard items are first is average flow time. Now, the average flow time is a very important terminology we all must know that is the average amount of time jobs spend in the shop. That when a job is entering into the workplace job shop and when the job is coming out of the workplace. So, the entire duration for which the job is inside the workplace that is known as average flow time. So, obviously, it is very simple to understand for any job we want to have this average flow time as low as possible. It means you will have less amount of WIP in your system. If your flow time is more that means job is for longer duration in your workplace and that will increase automatically your work in process inventories. The second is average number of jobs in system at any particular time how many number of jobs are there in the system. So, that is based on the capacity of your system that how many jobs your system can handle at a particular time. Then another rule is average job lateness. There is a particular due date we already knew that uh, for each job customer has given us uh, some target dates or we promised a particular date of delivery for a particular job. Now, it is possible that some of the jobs are delivered on time, but some of the jobs may be delayed also. So, you calculate the average lateness from your system. So, average job lateness is the average amount of time jobs completion date exceeds its promised delivery date. So, what is your average job lateness that also it is simple to understand that we want as minimum lateness as possible. If it is 0 that is the most ideal case that there is no delay from your system. So, that is a very important criteria for evaluating the performance of the system that our average job lateness is 0. Uh, uh, most of the airlines uh, they measure their productivity on this basis that uh, the average delay in the flights are 5 minutes, 10 minutes, 20 minutes uh, and based on that uh, we give the quality certifications to the airlines uh, that these airlines are able to maintain their system with very high level of efficiency. Then, Another important uh, criteria is changeover cost. The total cost of making machine changeovers uh, for group of jobs. Uh, as uh, multiple jobs are to be made on a particular machine A, B, C, D, E, etcetera, these different jobs you are going to make on the same machine one after another. So, what is the total changeover cost? Uh, so, if you have a right sequence, then you can minimize the changeover cost also. So, these are the different criteria and on the basis of various sequencing rule, we calculate these costs and which particular sequencing rule gives us minimum cost for that particular scenario, that particular job shop, that sequencing rule must be followed. Now, based on our researches, based on the field experience, normally there are some uh, uh, rules uh, or some of the observations uh, which are worth sharing at this time that first come first serve rule FCFS. This performs poorly on most evaluation criteria. You do not get uh, good results uh, of uh, FCFS and does give customers a sense of uh, fair play, but there is an issue with respect to that. Though from my point of view, if I am the organization, it is uh, going to have uh, low indicators for various performance criteria. But from the customer's point of view, from your point of view, you feel that you are fairly treated. You came to the system in queue at this particular time and uh, 
there is a proper Q discipline and according to that Q discipline you are being served. So, as we go to the airport for boarding passes, as we go to the airport for security checks, as we go for various services, this type of FCFS system is being followed. At that time, if a person who is ahead of me in the queue and that person is carrying lot of luggage and there may be some issues with the ticketing of that person, I am going alone without any baggage, but still so my processing time is maybe in few seconds, his processing time is in few minutes, maybe 20, 30 minutes, but still because of that FCFS system, uh, it is being served first and I will be served later on. So, because of uh, fair play kind of uh, perception, most of the service cases are being done on the basis of FCFS. So, this is normally done in service cases, where again the process focused manufacturing is taking place. Shortest processing time with respect to that, it performs well on many evaluation criteria. So, uh, you have uh, fairly decent performance indicators for SPT, but have to watch out for long processing time orders getting continuously pushed back. But you will see that uh, if some order where more processing is to be done, that will be continuously behind those items. So, the chances of delaying that order, if the processing time for some per order is very high, in that case uh, that order will always be pushed back and as a result of that, uh, uh, it, may, it may be uh, severely delayed because of uh, this SPT rule. Then critical ratio, you see as we are moving from FCFS to this uh, uh, SPT and then to critical ratio, you will see that uh, various parameters will start improving. It works well on average job lateness criteria. So, it is uh, uh, going to help you in reducing your average lateness, because it is combining both EDD and uh, this uh, processing time. So, it is going to reduce the average lateness. So, most of the jobs uh, will be delivered with due dates. So, therefore, your average job lateness will be low in this case. Many may focus too much on jobs that cannot be completed on time causing others to be late to. Because uh, it is combining due date and processing time. So, it may uh, be and uh, due to that uh, some time it may focus on too much on those jobs which cannot be completed on time. So, those jobs which cannot be completed on time, but because of this critical ratio issue, they may come into the processing and it may help, it may actually result into the delaying of other jobs also. So, that is a uh, you can say drawback or limitation of the critical ratio uh, issue. Now, let us have one example and with the help of this example, we see that how different uh, uh, rules are applied. Now, we want to apply these three rules FCFS, SPT, this is one sequencing rule, this is another sequencing rule and this is another sequencing rule. To sequence the five jobs A, B, C, D, E, these are the jobs, these are their processing time PTs and these are due dates. Evaluate the rules on the basis of average flow time average number of jobs in the system and average job lateness. So, let us start calculation for each rule separately. First, we are going to do for FCFS first come first serve. So, we assume that they are coming as per their uh, sequence A, B, C, D, E. So, A will be first then B then C then D then E. The processing times are mentioned, the promised completion time is also mentioned. So, that data we have taken directly from here. So, we have directly taken this data to the calculation of FCFS 6, 12, 9, 14, 8 and the promise completion dates uh, hours are also mentioned. Now, because this is the sequence of operation also. So, you see that uh, this job A is uh, entering into the system, job A is entering here and it is taking 6 hours. 
So, 6 hours it is coming out of the system. The promise time is 10th hour and it is already available at the 6th hour. So, the lateness is 0. Then B starts and B is taking 12. So, finally, it is 6, it is 18. So, it is coming out of the system on the 18th, but the promised time of delivery was the 16th hour. So, it is delayed by 2 hours, it is delayed by 2 hours. Then the third C, C has the processing time of 9. So, 18 plus 9, 27 C and the due date, due time was 8. So, 7, 27 minus 8, it is delayed by 19 hours. Then D will be there, it takes 14. So, it will take 14 and that makes uh, 41 and D will come out. And D was expected to be delivered on 14th, but you are delivering D on 41. So, it is delayed by 27 hours and then finally, E will enter, it is taking 8 hours. So, it will be out on the 49th hour and it is E. E was expected to be delivered on 7th hour, but E is coming on 49th hour. So, E is delayed by 42 hours. So, now you understand that it is having a flow time of 6, 18, 27, 41 and this is coming out of 49th. So, the total flow time is 141. These are late by respective units. See total late, total lateness. Now, with this data, we can calculate the various performance indicators. The average flow time, total flow time which system is taking is 141 hours. Total flow time which system is taking 141 hours. So, the and these are the 5 jobs A, B, C, D, E. So, average flow time is 141 divided by 5 that is 28.2 hours. The average number of jobs in the system in that uh, 141 you have the flow time for different jobs that is the maximum time is the 49th. So, average number of jobs are 141 divided by 49, 2.88 jobs. So, at any particular time out of uh, because from 0 to job A is there and on this is the total 49 and here E is coming out of the system. So, the meaning is that at any particular time in this system, at any particular time in this system, 2.88 jobs are in the system. At any particular time when you are seeing the system, system has 2.88 jobs and these jobs may be at different stages of their processing. Some are starting the processing, some are at some intermediate stage and some may be at the final stage. So, that is 2.88 jobs that is another performance indicating criteria for us. And the average job lateness, the total lateness was 90 minutes, 90 hours and 5 jobs are there. So, 90 by 5, 18 hours that is the average job lateness. So, we got with respect to FCFS the value of all these 3 criteria. Now, we go with the shortest processing time that is the another uh, criteria, another uh, you can say sequencing rule. So, A, B, C, D, E are there. Now, 6, 8, 9, 12, 14 these are the processing time. Now, we have arranged them it is uh, a matter of uh, chance that uh, we will produce them on the basis of uh, this processing time. So, you just see that these are first job is A, then E, then C, then B and then D. So, A, E you remember A, E, C, B, D, A, 
E C B D. So, that is how you are going to produce. So, this is A E C B and D. These will be the sequence of jobs which we are going to produce and their processing times are written 6 hours, 8 hours, 9, 12 and 40. And now doing the same calculation that first job A will enter then E then C then B and then D. And here you again calculated the flow time for each of them. Now you also calculated similarly as we did for FCFS the lateness and now you see the average flow time is 127 by 5 that is 25.4. You compare it with your FCFS it was 28.2. Now it has reduced to 25.4. The average number of jobs in the system it was 2.88 earlier now it has reduced to 2.59. The average lateness was earlier 18 hours now it has reduced to 15.2 hours. So, all these three parameters have improved, improved with respect to FCFS. All these three parameters have improved. Now, we go to the third type of calculation that is critical ratio rule. So, you calculate the critical ratio for all the activities. Now, there are A, B, C, D, E 5 jobs, the processing times are available to us and promise dates are also available to us. So, promise date that is due date divided by processing time that is your uh, critical ratio. So, critical ratio C R equals to promised date divided by available processing time. So, 7 divided by 8 it is 0 0.875, 8 divided by 9 0.889, 14 divided by 14 1, 16 divided by 12 1.33 and 10 divided by 6 1.67. Now, whichever critical ratio is lowest, so now in the case for E this is the lowest, so E will be processed first then C, then D, then B, then A. So, based on their critical ratio you are going to process and then you see that uh, what is the flow time that is again in the same way it is E which will be processed first after E it will be C then it will be D after that it will be B and then it will be A. So, that is how you are going to process uh, your various jobs in uh, this sequence and similarly you will calculate the flow time and the lateness for each of these jobs. So, the parameters 148 by 5 that is 29.6. So, for SPT it was around 25, but now it has increased average number of jobs in the system 148 divided by 49 that is 3.02 jobs that is also increased and average job lateness that is now is coming 93. So, 93 by 5, so that has also increased. So, now these are the inferior with respect to FCFS and even SPT. Now, you can understand that out of 3 sequencing rules, SPT gave us best performance and therefore, for this particular example, we are going to select the SPT rule as our sequencing criteria. So, uh, here we have summarized all these three things in a particular tabular form. So, you see that average flow time is 28.2 hours, 25.4 hours and 29.6 hours. Average number of jobs 2.88, 2.59 and 3.02 that is also again better and average job lateness 18 hours, 15.2 hours and 18.6. So, Overall, with respect to all three criteria, our SPT has resulted in a superior performance. So, SPT rule is better 
with respect to all three cases and that is going to be the sequencing rule for this particular example. Now, the other particular issue is with respect to changeover costs. So, changeover cost is associated that uh, changing the machine settings and uh, getting the new job instructions, uh, the changing the working material, the uh, raw material or changing the tools. So, all these things are uh, required which are uh, to be done whenever there is a change of the job and all these things actually incur some type of cost. So, you need to see that uh, how these changeovers should be done so that your overall cost should be as low as possible. So, uh, for that purpose we have uh, uh, some kind of heuristics. So, you heuristics you understand that uh, we do not have any kind of uh, mathematical proof for them, but uh, based on our experience based on some you can say established conventions uh, these are considered to give you the lowest possible uh, change over cost in this particular case. So, uh, here we start with the lowest change over cost from one job to another job and in that sequence we keep changing the jobs. For an example, this is a particular type of diagram and this change over cost issue is to some extent those who are familiar with operations research, they will find that it is similar to assignment problems. So, that uh, how a traveling salesman problem is designed similar to that uh, this kind of problems are being handled. So, here you have uh, A, B, C, D, E 5 jobs and uh, these are mentioned on both the sides. So, if uh, job A is there, so what will be the cost if job B will be done after A? What will be the cost if job C is done after A? What will be the cost if job D is done after A? And that is how this entire uh, matrix is being presented that what will be the cost of changeover if uh, after a particular job another job is done after E, E is done and after E if I want to do A the cost will be 62, after D if I want to do C cost will be 67. So, that is how you will read uh, this particular table. Now, you will develop based on our heuristic, you will develop uh, this kind of job sequence uh, that after A, if uh, you follow D, so it is 50 dollar is the least changeover cost, A follows D. So, if you see the A follows D, then uh, it is the 50 dollar, A follows the D, D is this and after D you are doing A. So, the this is the lowest cost. So, first you identify out of this which is the lowest changeover cost. So, in this entire matrix 50 is the lowest possible cost. So, you have freezed one sequence that after D you are going to have A. Now, since you have fixed after D A, so you will see that C follows A that is another important thing because now you will see that the next job should be after this. So, after A you cannot have this D. So, this is out and out of the remaining 95, 92, 125 this is the lowest. So, after A you will have C and now you want next job to be done after C. So, after C you will not do D because D is already done and A is already done. So, out of these two B and E, B is the minimum. So, this you will select as your next cost, next job that is B. Now, you have after B already D, A, C, B 4 jobs are being selected. So, the next will be E. So, this becomes your sequence D A C B E and the cost of this particular plan is 286 dollars. So, that is the minimum changeover cost system also that is going to help you in minimizing the cost of your total system. Then another important issue in this particular case 
is to minimize your total production time. How to minimize your total production time? Now, in this particular case, where you have uh, jobs which are n in number, n jobs and two work centers, there can be multiple cases, but we are going to discuss only one particular case that jobs are infinite, jobs are n and uh, work centers are two. You can have uh, three or more work centers also, but we are not going to complicate just going to introduce you that uh, how to sequence uh, various activities on two work centers. So, means uh, you have these two work centers A and B and there are jobs like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and all these 5 jobs require some operation to be done on A and some operation to be done on B and the sequence is also fixed that first it will be done on A and then it will go to B and but they will take some different time of processing on A and B like for A 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 it takes uh, 3 minutes here, it takes 2 minute here, it takes 1 minute here, it takes 4 minute here, it takes uh, 2 minute here, it takes 2 minute here. So, on you have different time taken by different jobs uh, on these 2 machines. So, how we can sequence these things? So, Johnson's rule is known which is uh, used to find the sequence uh, that minimize the total production time through both work centers. So, now let us see how do we have this uh, Johnson's rule applicable. Now, for this purpose we have this theory also available with us uh, that uh, what are the various steps to take uh, this minimum scheduling time and uh, with the help of one example we will like to do uh, this particular Johnson's rules application. Here it is uh, uh, the theory of that example it is early Saturday morning and the finest detail has 5 uh, automobile waiting for uh, the detailing service. Each vehicle goes through a thorough exterior wash, wax processing and then an interior vacuum, shampoo and polish process. So, you have uh, different types of uh, uh, cars available and uh, the cars are uh, cleaned interior and with exterior also. The entire detailing crew must stay until the last vehicle is completed. If the 5 vehicles are sequenced so that the total processing time is minimized, when can the crew go home? They will start the first vehicle at 7.30 am and now we see the time estimates for different types of uh, jobs. So, there are uh, these 5 different types of uh, luxury cars and uh, you have uh, time taken for the exterior work and for the interior work uh, for these different types of. Uh, so, the exterior work and the interior these are the jobs and these are the two you can understand machines or the work centers. The exterior time is one type of work center and interior time is another type of work center and we need to just uh, develop a sequence uh, that which machine or which particular job to be processed first and accordingly we will go further. Now, by applying the Johnson's rule, by applying the Johnson's rule, we see that out of 2, out of 2 because it is a fixed schedule that uh, first exterior and then interior. Now, out of uh, all the time estimations available, we will see that uh, which time is the minimum and the minimum time is the first m 1 this is minimum 1 and therefore, the first job to be scheduled is uh, infinity, but it will be scheduled for the last position for the B for interior, interior fifth position because you have 5 machines uh, 5 jobs. So, there will be 5 positions, first position, second position, third position, fourth position, fifth position. So, th at the fifth position, so for A and for B like this. Now, you have scheduled infinity at the fifth position. Now, 
the second lowest value is uh, after this is this 1.6 that is the m2. So, this will go for the fourth position again on the second because the lowest times are coming from the second table that is Porsche. So, this is the fourth position. Then out of the remaining 3, the lowest is 1.9 that is M3. Now, this M3 is coming from the first column. So, this will go to the first position in your A category. So, Lexus will take the first position. Then out of these two Cadillac and Bentley, the minimum time is coming 2 that is M4. So, this will take the second position at the work center 1 and then obviously, the only time available is uh, uh, 2.1 that is the M3, M5 sorry and this will go to the third position here. So, this is the sequence uh, that Lexus, Cadillac, Bentley, Porsche and Infinity in this way you will have uh, your jobs. So, Infinity is for the fifth slot, Porsche for the fourth slot, Lexus for the first slot, Cadillac for the second slot and Bentley for the third slot. So, in this way we have fixed these uh, slots uh, using the Johnson's rule and uh, when we have uh, the presentation of this Johnson's rule on this uh, type of a Gantt chart you can say this will give you that uh, uh, how long the service is going to remain there, how long the crew has to stay at the workshop. So, we are starting at the morning uh, 7.30 am and we will start with Lexus. The first work we are going to start with the Lexus and at that time you see your uh, the second work station in remaining idle. Now, the Lexus is taking 1.9 hours, it is taking 1.9 hours Lexus is taking for exterior work 1.9. So, only after 1.9 hours uh, the work station 2 will come into picture. So, after 1.9 hours uh, Lexus will go to work station 2 and it will take uh, 2.1, 2.2 hours for completing the interior activities. Then the second was Cadillac. So, Cadillac will start after 1.9 and it is taking 2 hours. So, it will be with work station 1 and after that Cadillac will go to here. Then Bentley, then Porsche and last is Infinity. And here this Infinity is going to finish at the 12th hour, but for this much duration the first work station will remain idle. So, the first work station is remaining idle at the end period and the second work station is remaining idle in the beginning of the workshop, but total duration which you are taking in the workshop is 12 hours. So, the workers the garage opens at 7.30 am, your crew comes at 7.30 am, but crew will be able to depart only at 7.30 pm. So, that is the total production time in a particular case when you have two systems and multiple jobs to be scheduled on these two systems. But this is the minimum time though this is a heuristic it is not based on any kind of uh, algorithm it is a heuristic but it gives you the minimum time for completing the total activities. So, with this we come to end of uh, this session where we discussed uh, various types of sequencing rules, uh, we discussed how to minimize our total changeover cost uh, and how to minimize our total uh, production time. All these things are very important criteria in developing a good robust uh, scheduling plan. So, with this uh, we finish this session. Thank you very much.